There you go. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us here today. Um, my name is Abby Prince. I'm in Central Illinois at my home office of um, Leadership, where, believe it or not, not a cloud in the sky and the sun is shining and it truly feels like spring and I couldn't be happier. So thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you're having very similar weather or whatever is bringing sunshine into your day if it's not the actual sun. We are um, kicking off and further moving further into our sixth series of virtual conversations for leadership educators. And how we do, as we do that, I was thinking Zoom is probably a familiar platform to many of you. And if it's not, I've popped up this um, screen here for everyone. If you need some guidance on how to um, post comments in the chat, we will have a couple poll questions here in a couple minutes just to get a sense of who's all in the room and who's with us today. Maria Tatman, I see your comment there and you are also the sunshine of my day. So thank you for that. Um, if you have questions that you wouldn't like to make public that you just wanna make private so that the question is still asked or a comment is still um, made, then you can share that with me in the chat by choosing where it says everyone in the chat, just choose that drop down, and you can choose Abby Prince, that's me, um, to ask your question. Um, if you want to choose to um, keep yourself muted, that would be great as far as um, making sure that Shay's got time to be the voice of our conversation here today. Please, please feel free to leave your cameras on or off, whatever is best for you, and primarily responding in the chat to the questions just to keep our conversation here moving along. As we start our time together today, I do want to offer a land acknowledgement on behalf of leadership and thinking about how we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land each of us is on today is the original homelands of indigenous and tribal nations. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from these territories, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land. Please honor and acknowledge the native and indigenous peoples from the land with which you are joining us from and give thought to your ancestry and the generations that came before you. I know I mentioned I'm in central Illinois. I'm on the lands of um, former lands of um, Potawatomi and Kickapoo tribes. Um, and so I'm glad to um, be connected to you all in that way. And I hope you're spending time and thinking about where you're from today as well. Leadership's vision and mission statement are listed for you here. We really care about a just, caring, and thriving world where all lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible and the ways in which we bring more people into that community in order to transform the world. So thank you for joining us as part of that community today as we're thinking about that leadership community and the ways in which we all stay connected. Um, I mentioned earlier, my name is Abby Prince. Um, I'm joining you as the representative from Leadership. I'm the director of program quality and management here at Leadership. Um, I believe my dog Truman is about to join us. So we'll see what happens next. You just never know. Um, I am so glad to be joined by Shay Kidhouse um, today and talking about this topic around the pivot fatigue that we all feel, the lessons learned from leadership educators. You all know about Dr. House, Kid House, as you've read her, her bio um, in the meeting invite for this session today. But Shay, I would love it if you would do a brief introduction and um, perhaps welcome everyone. Yes, well, thank you, Abby. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm a longtime uh, Leadership fan and have been a part of the community for several years now. My name is Shay Kid House. I use she, her, hers, and I serve as Associate Vice Chancellor and Dean of Students in big orange country, and I'm always representing the orange, um, recognizing there's lots of campuses, looks like from Hawaii uh, all the way to Georgia. Um, so very, very exciting. Yes, Luke, go balls. And so I um, look forward to just sharing space with you. And I say that very um, authentically in that we will get to co-create conversation today um, using the chat feature and um, just am really excited to talk about this with you. I have not uh, figured out pivot fatigue, but I look forward to talking with you about maybe some things that, that we've learned collectively. Thank you, Shay. I appreciate that. I think that you're you're embodying that spirit that leadership believes in so much about how we are all teachers and learners. And so to be in this place of let's figure this thing out together and let's talk about it more together. It feels very leader shapey and it feels very Shay. So thank you so much for inviting us into that space with you today. 
Absolutely. Jay has shared a couple of poll questions with us that I'm going to display for you all. And this will help us get a sense of who's all with us and what experiences have you had um, throughout this last year where pivot fit fatigue has become a word that or a phrase that we use often. So and our first question here, what is the current state of your campus planning for fall 2021? Will you be fully in person, fully online, some sort of weird combination of those two, or are you still deciding? Seeing those responses come in. This feels pretty encouraging. Okay. Couple more people are responding there. All right. So I will share those poll results with you here. It looks like the majority of people will be fully in person and um, most others will have a combination of those two things. So I feel like that is encouraging to see that. Let me display poll question number two for you here, which is when is your staff scheduled to return to campus in person? Are you already back? Are you transitioning over the summer? You haven't decided yet or you're remaining virtual? It's an easy question to, to answer. Hopefully no one needed to study ahead for this. Okay. And that one is really interesting to me because uh, we're having conversations on our campus about returning. And I think a lot of us in our work have been, we've been here. <laughs> so that, that conversation is really interesting. Yeah. So, and it looks pretty evenly split there for folks that are already back or maybe have that staggered back where a certain number of staff members are back um, and then you'll transition over the summer. Um, and then poll question three of three is what's your current energy level? Yeah. I don't know, Shay, if you're watching these responses come in as well, but I was like, yeah, this is, yeah, this is kind of what I thought. I feel a little validated perhaps, but let me share these poll results with you here. It looks like most people are exhausted, running on fumes. Some are in the middle of the road um, with regard to energy level. There are three people that I would love to tap into somehow that are the Energizer Bunny and have never felt better. My hat is off to you, friends. I don't know how you do it, but I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Well, thank you for responding to those poll questions there. So I, before I turn things over to Shay, I just want to kind of recognize that um, pivot um, was just a word. It was something that we made fun of um, Ross Geller for saying often with a couch. And now it has become something that is more familiar as we think about what we do in this time and how we've had to make um, shifts in this time. And so there's no doubt that we've all been challenged to shift and adjust our programs and our services constantly over the last year. But at what cost to us? And what does that look like to us as the practitioners, perhaps, of that pivot? And so we've asked Shay to join us to, if not answer that question, then guide us through that conversation. So use the chat box for any questions, comments, and resources that you might have. And now you all are so lucky that I'm going to turn things over to Shay as we learn more collectively about pivot fatigue. Thanks so much, Abby, and um, thanks to you all for being here and for um, lending your time as well. We're all, uh, we all have full days, as I say, we don't use the word busy in my areas because uh, we're all busy. And so we use full and we put our hands in there, full days. And so uh, I appreciate you being here and also participating in the poll. That's just helpful to know that we are not alone. I think so often we feel alone because the pandemic has really caused us to, to have to be uh, in a lot of ways from a safety perspective. Um, so I appreciate that. And I also need to locate these Energizer bunnies. Um, please put your name in the chat and let's connect. Um, tell, me, tell me your secrets. Um, I know that many of us, if you're on a semester construct on your campus, you probably have about three weeks left of, of course time, uh, plus finals, give or take. And so it is that if you're in a higher ed institution, we are 
in that last stretch. Um, I know we have some runners on the call, so it's kind of like you can see that finish line, but you're not quite there. Um, so I hope that this will be this conversation will be well timed. And um, we've said conversation a lot, and so to get us started, you've already participated, but. Um, I'm really curious. There's a lot going on in the world. It continues to be um, a challenging time for us. And um, so I would love it if you would just start by sharing um, a one word of how you feel right now. And you can utilize the chat just so we can um, see and honor those experiences. And then I will um, read them aloud. Um, but if you'll just start putting in just one word of how you feel right now, and uh, we will we will amplify those voices. So tired, an easy, awesome, probably an energizer bunny, okay-ish, disappointed, PTSD, breathing, apathetic-ish, frazzled, lost, nostalgic, tired, persisting, resilient, Split, uncertain, tired, overwhelmed, complex, apathetic, exasperated. Hi, Madison, good to see you. Strong. And you can continue to reflect on, on that and, and continue to participate and contribute in the chat. But the thing is, we, we all feel um, differently. And I think it's important that we give voice to how we're feeling. That's something that's been really important during this season for me is to un unapologetically name where I am um, because then you can kind of work through that. You know, if you don't really put a word to where you are, then you're just kind of existing. And um, and so I, I use um, happy, sad sometimes. it's. It's, it's two words, but I put them together, or nervous, excited, because I think we've also lived in a both-and world where sometimes there may even be guilt about feeling happy, uh, given everything that's going on, um, yet, you know, there's kind of this overwhelming grief and sadness and loss, um, given what, everything that's going on. So, um, so thank you for that. It's good to, again, have another pulse check of where everyone is. So we're going to transition I, as I was putting this together, thinking about some of the, the key questions, maybe that can guide our conversation. And so, um, Abby, if we can transition over to to those guiding questions, I want to, you know, this is a starting point. There may be some other questions that you you think about and please put those in the, the chat as well as maybe some conversation starters for us. But um, you know, we're going to come back to these questions, but I really want you to reflect on these and have a moment to do that. Um, you know, the question, how are you? I, I really want to know. Um, so we're going to kind of talk about that. Um, what what have our sources of joy been and while we're moving around and changing and shifting, um, thinking about gratitude and how's that shown up for us um, over this period and, and what ways have our values been front and center? Have our values been tossed? Have our institutional values been front and center? Have they been tossed? Um, what were your pre-COVID dreams? So I have an executive coach and this is something she asked me two weeks ago and it has stuck with me. What were your pre-COVID dreams? How are you planning for the re-entry? So it looks like most of us and, and or all of us will be back um whatever back means <laughs> um lots of air quotes so how are we planning for that how are we thinking about that and what have we learned to me is is one of the most important questions because we're learning a lot and and how do we capture what we're learning because i think we need to 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 really write that down and do something with it like oh we've learned so much and then we go back to like what we wanted before because we've missed that so um, that in my mind would be a missed opportunity so, so those are some of the things that are going to guide our our conversation in, in just a moment and anybody who knows me and i know several of you on the call knows that i use the word context about 50 times a day so um my lived experience sort of gets at that um, and just to give you a brief, brief overview, I am from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, 60 miles from the Gulf Coast, a Black woman growing up in the state of Mississippi with a grandmother who was very active in the civil rights movement, 
Um, so that's a story in and of itself. Um, and then over the course of my life, really just gaining such an affinity from learning from other people. And so I think we always have to start with what's going on right now. You know, we can't just jump in without acknowledging and honoring um, where we are and why we're so tired. <laughs> so, um, and I didn't, I failed to share my one word uh, for the day. And my word is excited because any chance I give, get to give back to an organization that has given so much to me um, over the past um, decade, most specifically, it really fuels, feeds my soul, and then to be able to see and connect with each of you. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about context, oh, my favorite word. If you were a Jay Leno fan when Jay Leno was still a thing, there would be like a ticker for the person who said the word a lot. So y'all can maybe count how many times I say context twice so far. Um, so uh, let's think back to uh, 55, 56 weeks ago. You know, that's kind of where we are in this whole process. Um, and a lot has happened, and I want to to just name that a lot has happened. Another word for me today is heavy. Um, in, here in Knoxville, there was a, a shooting yesterday at one of our high schools, and um, it ended in a fatality, and so there's a lot of heaviness for me, and I think I need to name that and acknowledge that as well as I just make sense of the world and in, in, in which we live right now. Um, Another area that many of us have, have tried to navigate this year is racial reckoning, you know, um, thinking about, uh, you know, in my own life as, as a black woman, this information wasn't new to me last year. It just felt different that more people were paying attention. And sadly that came uh, because of egregious murders of black and brown bodies and um, really I think has caused us as a nation to re-examine our uh, complicated history. Um, we couple that with uh, what we knew would be a political cycle, which is, you know, always some element of contentious. Um, but I think we reached new heights of that this year when um, there was an election cycle, there was an election, there was no um, concession for months um, on top of already, you know, being inside a pandemic. Uh, increased demands on all of us. So the Chronicle of Higher Education did a shout out to people who do work like we do and it was called Team No Sleep. So just acknowledging that not only are we working hard, but many times our institutions collectively and on our specific institutions, we feel like we're doing more yet we're being told to do more. And so it's just this continuous cycle of, um, of demands and, and what that has looked like. It's also been a demand on boundaries because uh, Zoom created this plugin to Outlook. So you create a Zoom and it's already on your calendar without a conversation, um, without checking with that person to see if that time's good or not, you know, so just the boundaries, I think, became really complicated. It also has made us, we're accessible all the time. Um, so, you know, the nature of taking a vacation, those kinds of things has been challenging. I also think there's been a lot of isolation. I mentioned this earlier, especially when our whole country essentially shut down, we're home, um, and all the, the challenges that could come with that. <clears throat> mental health concerns really bubbled up for us individually, for our students, for those we work alongside. Um, I call this one mission meandering. So this, you know, when you have a crisis, everyone has a solution. And there are people who work in crisis every day, you know. So there are people who have, we have an emergency operations command director who's been waiting for a catastrophe. So he, his name's Brian Gard and Maria, I can see your screen. So Maria works on a campus. So, you know, we had, it was important for us to look to Brian, you know, this is his job. He's been training. We've been doing tabletop exercises since he came. Um, he was not prepared for this, but he was prepared process wise. And for me in my role, I work in crisis from a student perspective. So I find, found that in a crisis, um, there was a lot of like, you know, people say, get in your lane. I call it mission meandering. It's a little friendlier. Um, so I observed that quite a bit. 
Um, and then grief and loss of those we love, those we don't know, just as we continue to see the numbers of the deaths rise. Um, and grief also came from a standpoint of what could have been or what we had planned for, right? So think about graduates from 2020 or special events like um, marriages or even celebrations of life um, at end of life, what that looked like. Um, and that's, that's difficult. Um, we also had some significant losses that are, that are people that we know or, or that we have admired from a distance like John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And, you know, so those, those pieces were, were really interesting. And then, you know, to not state the obvious, but to take, state the obvious, we're working in a pandemic. We're on Zoom. Like we haven't seen people in 3D for over a year on a regular basis. And that is something that unfortunately has become our norm, um, but we have to continue to remind ourselves that this is not normal, that we need connection, that we need people in our lives physically. So those are just some of the things I wanna name. And then as we fast forward to today, even you know, um, a significant trial in Minnesota, a significant loss in Minnesota. Um, and so there's just a lot of heaviness um, that we have continued to, to consider while we work through um, these challenges. So with that context, let's go back to those guiding questions. And really, this is not a Shea show. So this is, you know, I'm going to ask these questions and would love your, um, your responses in the chat and I'll amplify those and, and we'll have a conversation. So um, the first, the first question is, how are you? And what I want to start with is the importance of asking the question. So often in our culture, at least in the United States, we say, how are you? And I like that, Maria, <laughs> um, podcast in the making. Um, we say, how are you? And we keep moving. You know, when I was a teenager, I had the, for the great fortune of visiting Africa. And when you say, when you ask, how are you? You better be standing still because there's gonna be a response and you need to be waiting to then respond and have a conversation. Um, a lot of times we say, hey, how are you? Keep going. So just the importance of the how are you? So I'm, I'm curious if, um, in what ways have you been able to check in with one another or have you appreciated um, being checked on? Um, I'm curious and if you can just use the chat um, on how this is maybe been salient for you um, or not, you know, there's always the or not. I haven't felt that this year. Um, in what ways has that been important to you over the past season? I will recognize my privilege here as your co-host and being able to just unmute myself and share if that's okay. But as people are responding here, I'm just thinking about, you mentioned this earlier, Shay, but just that feeling of like, sometimes things are good and you kind of carry a guilt around feeling that there's something to celebrate. But I think it's learning to like be okay with both of those things that it's good in a bad time or it's good, but there are also bad things is- sure. It feels difficult. It feels, well, it feels like a pivot, I think, to, to learn to hold both of those things. Yeah, yeah we, we've been conditioned that it has to be either or. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think that that is why that tension exists because we feel like we have to choose and we can, um, we can exist in both. And there's some, some comments coming in. Abby, I appreciate you getting us started. Is, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Kira writes, uh, reclaiming emotions being authentic I love that hashtag. yes i do too we need to use that mm -hmm. um speaking up and amplifying voices of historically excluded and marginalized populations i wake and give gratitude every morning before going back to working in a pandemic yeah and and i think 
gratitude is, is, you know, one of those things I see how it, I, I use the word embed because it's not like checkbox. And I love how you start us with that yeah. um, because it really helps us to think about what's going right. It does not discount what's going wrong, but it really helps us to center ourselves in that. And I, and I agree around, you know, the historically excluded and currently excluded. Um, and, and one of the things we've done in, in staff meetings, and I have a staff, at least one staff member I saw on the call, is we start with this question. You know, it's a check-in every, every Monday um, because we need to do that. And we also, um, I, have, I have not gotten it right every time, but, you know, sending a short message when something has happened because we're not in the same space. So um, that's been a way for us to connect. Um, Madison writes, emotional authenticity has been key. So um, yeah, being able, and, and what I would say, Madison, because I know you, is also um, the importance of uh, a reputation for authenticity because in moments where we are, we are right now, where there is a crisis, people know you beforehand. And so then students know that, that they can come to you. And so students, and students checking on you, right? So it's not just one-sided. I love that. Um, and then a shout out uh, from Maria to Sylvina. Sylvina. Hopefully I um, came close. Um, my full name is Shaladia. And so I apologize if I didn't say that correctly um, because I, I have greatly appreciated those who can say my name over the years. Um, so just an affirmation to you. And then appreciated your partner checking in. So um, on how stress levels are. And absolutely, if, you have, if you're in a partnership or if you have close friends, the importance of that. Um, checking on students, Luke shares. Um, and that there's no shame, right? No shame that you're struggling. That's why I say, hello, we're living in a pandemic. Like, this is not normal. Like I continue to tell people like- I've never done this before. <laughs> exactly. I remember um, I follow uh, Brene Brown's work and she started a podcast during the pandemic and shared in one of the first episodes that Adrenaline is designed for two weeks. So we're in- 52 plus weeks. So there, if you feel like you're not doing it right, you're, you're not, cause we're not supposed to do this long-term, right? So there is, there's affirmation there, giving yourself grace. Absolutely. Terry. Um, and there's some, some agreement there. Um, okay. This is important. So having comments around toning down authentic feelings. Um, so now I answer the question, I'm good. And so, you know, that's such a, important thing too is that we are we don't always acknowledge where people are or affirm that and so I hope that you can um, get to a space where that is appreciated or you know build community here and um, you know there find people on this chat that you can you can be your authentic self too because it's important to have that um, normalizing toxic pos positivity absolutely so there is a I think giving ourselves permission to say, it, things aren't good. I'm not, I'm having a bad day. I, I started my staff meeting yesterday with, I'm exhausted, you know, and I'm the campus cheerleader for those who are on this campus. Like I am always out. I was giving away milkshakes because it was Monday and we love alliteration and we had grilled cheese for National Grilled Cheese Day. So it was a really good day, but I was really tired. And so I said that. Um, I think that's important for us to do that. Hey, Kara, Kara and I graduated from UGA together um, for our master's. Um, so finding joy in the little things. Absolutely. And that's the thing, the marble jar, those small moments, those are the things that really carry us through. We can't have those big moments every day. Um, just uh, thinking through, I'm gonna make sure I try to get through a lot of these comments. Um, and let's see, uh, Karis, hello, asked, um, how are you is most typically asked in moments where people feel like they should be checking in, but fail to continue to, oh, what a great, great, okay, Karis was an undergrad student at the University of Southern Mississippi with me, and then at, at UTK, so um, she's taught me a lot over the years, not the other way around, so great, great comment, absolutely, and um, some more comments about toxic positivity, Dedicating time on the calendar to check in. That is that. great, Shane. Yeah. 
Um, what a great idea, because the thing is, we're all, our brains are going a lot of different ways. So we have to have those mechanisms to help us remember. Just because we remember doesn't mean it's not important. We just need those, those ways to do that. Yeah. Um, connection point. So, um, and then uh, identifying connection points with other people that are important um, to you. Absolutely, Sean, good to see you. And then Michelle, the struggle between authenticity and performative positivity. Yes. Um, and to me, that's where the one, you've got to build in trust. You've got to have an environment where you can do that, you know, where you feel like you can. I have a, um, a great team in my central office where we really have that and we can say, I'm really struggling today, you know. And there are some times where I have to just turn it on, you know, if I'm, you know, doing the chancellor's live update and there's seven people, 700 people on the call, you know, probably not, they're probably not going to be a one word check in there. Um, but um, there are spaces where I need to make sure I have that. So thank y'all. Those are great, great comments. Um, I see some connections coming in. So send each other direct messages if you're able to, I'm not sure if they're able to do that. Yeah, looks like you're able to do that um, so, so that you're able to connect with one another. And some of you talked about the second question already, but joy you know mm -hmm. those those opportunities to find joy Kara talked about it in the little things you know those those ordinary moments um what what are sources of joy for you during this period um and as you're thinking I will say I am a Myers-Briggs J I like order and structure so this has not been great for me initially. <laughs> um, I did not really know what to do. And uh, strategic is also my Clifton strength number one. So just in maximizer number two. So it just felt like, ooh, none of these are really performing at the highest level. And so I quickly learned that I was, my body was telling me I was really stressed and I got, I had to find um, joy. So one of those things was starting a walk. So we had an emergency operations call every day uh, at eight if they're really part of the pandemic once we went home. And so I started walking, I started listening to uh, the EOC meeting and then we'd have a break and I'd listen to Unlocking Us. So it found, it gave me joy just to mm -hmm. be learning, but also moving my body. Somebody said working out, being outside, um, getting to see daughters at the bus daily, checking in with my people. Hi, Abby, good to see you. Cuddling with my dog, painting. And our, isn't it great that our dogs participate in our calls? You know, they wait until we have a call and then they bark. I'm not speaking from personal uh, experience at all. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, a good laugh. Reading through what people are sharing about what brings them joy is yes. so touching. I love this. It is. Children, a good laugh. Love that photography and y'all need to check out Sean Holloway's photography I'm just telling you he's talented Netflix watch parties getting outside yeah moving our body I mean I, I see a theme of moving our bodies however we're able to do that um in the sunshine I don't I'm not sure about where you live where I live um like today the sun's not shining and in the winter it does not shine it's a hard place to live in the winter especially for my girl who's six from 60 miles north of the gulf um and so that you have to find your sunshine, like creating your own sunshine is really important. Um, seeing the world through a two-year-old, how beautiful is that? Mm -hmm. Dogs, lots of dogs, comments, and lots of comments around pets. I think too, what I've talked to people about is the importance of the dinner table. You know, like take, we, we slowed down, right? Yeah. We had to, we were forced to. And so my family, um, we didn't really have dinner at the dinner table because I was generally on campus mm -hmm. or we were grabbing a bag and go I'm, I mean that's that was just our life and so to be able to grill and you know my fiance loves to cook and I love to eat it's a great partnership and so we have dinner time now and we sit at the table and we have conversations like how was your day you know, like uh, if you've gone through the Leadership Resilience Program, that's an important question to ask, you know, is just having that time to say, how was your day? And looking someone in the eye. So dancing in your living room. Yes, Tracy, I love it. Um, so uh, I love that you're able to do this. And like Abby said, like reading through this, are y'all smiling? Because my cheeks are a little sore. It, it gives 
Mm-hmm. It gives happiness just engaging other people in their happiness. So this might be something you could do at a staff meeting um, with friends um, in a group me, whatever that looks like, um, really important. Okay, so thinking about joy and connecting that to gratitude, um, I would love to know how people, um, how do you, ref- how do you, uh, what's the word? capture your gratitude I guess how do you are you like a person who thinks about it and you just are consciously thinking about it do you write it down do you have a gratitude jar um you know I have a you can't see it because it's actually I think I can change my um my screen for a second I have this little board of feel goods you know um in my office so that's a really nice thing but um Oh, share our family whoops of the day so we can celebrate. That's awesome. <laughs> Noticing the evolving nature of plants, fruits, mm-hmm. vegetables. So there's, I see some mindfulness practice in here too, as y'all are sharing. Um, that is um, a really good way to, to also just slow things down a little bit. Um, you know, gratitude is one of those elements of our lives and as I said again I I use the word embed that I think it's it's something we can we can see in a lot of different parts so um there's a good news Fridays where you sing good news that's awesome a gym jar words of wisdom a personal gratitude journal that's also great um and also for those of you who aren't like pen paper people maybe you like apps or you like electronic um ways to capture so the calm app and i don't i'm about to sound like an infomercial (laughs) i don't work for calm i'm not getting paid for this um but calm can't you can set it up where at a certain time of day it gives you a prompt for what you're grateful for so then you can just capture it there if you have the app and then go back to it um so there's lots of different ways um to do it again a way to that I do it is is embedding it in meetings um, and thinking about, you know, as you're talking to the people, we spend more time with our colleagues a lot of times than those in our family. Kind words folder, Marie, I love that. Um, A whiteboard with space to write things. Yes, and so for those of you who maybe say, I don't have gratitude practice, these are some great ideas. Um, some some of you who love pho- photography, I know somebody said that, you know, using Instagram as a way to document gratitude or um, being able to, to think about the mechanisms you have in your home space or your office space to write things down. Um, there's a saying, it is not joy that makes us grateful, it's gratitude that makes us joyful. And so um, it really fuels um, that, that part of us. Um, someone asked me on a, a, a speech I was giving, a talk I was giving, like, what, why are you so positive? And I'm like, well, I think it's gratitude. I think it's that element of just sort of acknowledging that there are things that don't go our way, but there always some, there's always something that, that went our way. Like today, traffic was awesome. Like there wasn't any. So that's something I can say, that was great. I didn't have any hiccups getting here. Um, so there's a, a, some profiles on Instagram that you can check out. Sticky notes, uh, dropping sticky notes off on people's desks. So great, great, great conversations. Okay, so this is a big one. We could probably talk for the next 19 minutes about this one, um, but you know, values are so important. And uh, you know, leadership is a values-based organization. If you've gone through the curriculum, it's it's woven through every piece of it um and so i'm here i would love to know this is a you know in what ways have our values shown up this is a it could be good or bad (laughs) so um you know this could be uh, i I often say when things are are bad you typically learn truly what people's values are because i think when when things favor us it's easy to say these are my values, you know, grace, respect, equity. These are my values. As long as there's no crisis or there's no, nothing challenging that, or, you know, competing values within my core values or competing constituencies. Um, so, you know, I, as y'all are thinking about this response, a, I think our university, the University of Tennessee Knoxville had a set of values that are on our website, you know, that are public, 
But during this period, our chancellor said in comments one day, um, we will be compassionate and flexible and, and creative. And so those three things, be compassionate, be flexible, be creative, just became what we did <laughs> this year. And um, so that is a very tangible thing that it, it institutionally um, how it's shown up. But what are some other ways that you feel like values have been on point or off um, over the last year? And this can be personal or examples organizationally. <laughs> Yes, Sean. So I appreciate you sharing those. And I'll brag on Sean as a, a current grad student. And we talk a lot about values in our critical issues in higher ed course and, and how these guide us. And so one, you've got to know what your core values are. You know, so it's not like your top five strengths. They don't bubble up. <laughs> like you need to know what they are and they should be pretty steady. Um, because if they change all the time, then you're, you're kind of inconsistent in how you navigate through life. So um, guided Sean through navigating conversations, really important, um, and to help you be yourself, which is great. Um, for Purdue, um, you work hard, oops, they're coming in, work hard to problem solve, kept a residential campus running for 40,000 students. Wow, Julie, that is uh, a story that needs to be shared. That's amazing. Um, Though challenged uh, boundaries, thinking about the importance of boundaries, taking a lunch, yes, leaving at 5 p.m., right. And leaving at 5 p.m. on Zoom can be hard because people are like, hey, I'm sent you a link. No, true story, someone sent me a link at 6.30. I said, do y'all know what it is, 6.30? Like, we, <laughs> we're, okay. So um, I won't go down, <laughs> go, go down that path, but um, yeah. And keeping a list of your values right next to your monitor. I actually have my, values on the same tech board that I just showed you so that you can see them. Um, someone is mentioning their departmental, Michelle mentioning your departmental uh, values to include or include support and empower. Um, one of the ways that Michelle has been practicing this is by weekly anti-racism discussion guided by a deck of cards with questions and that is so important. So when we have these, these moments, um, we talk about them a lot right then, but sustaining that conversation over time is really challenging. And so that's such a great example of, of living out your values every day, um, creating space for staff meetings, for people to be authentically unhappy, um, at Madison. And I feel like, you know, we've all been challenged. I feel like our residential staff have really been challenged because that work doesn't end at five you know you're always and on top of that students are isolating and, and those kinds of things um and then luke is sharing humility gratitude and empathy and learning um, to be my most effective self professionally and personally uh, oh a core value forgiving yes what a good one and that's hard right grace has been hard because our fuses are shorter at least mine um is shorter because we're tired, you know, physically, mentally. I learned that on Zoom, many of us had this, why am I so tired? I'm sitting in the same spot all day, but our eyes wander very differently. So we might have five different screens. So when we think about pivot fatigue, we've got, we're literally on a, we could be on a call. We've got 10 windows open. We're answering our email. If you're like me and use a Mac, your text messages come up on your computer, you know, so it's just like constant um, engagement in a very different way than in-person um, conversation. So, yeah, I encourage you to think about your values. Again, um, name them. You know, there's lots of exercises online where you can print out a PDF and um, there's a list of lots of words and um doing an exercise of maybe circling the 10 that jump out to you and trying to narrow that down to really about three, um, ideally, just so that you have a default. And if you're coming through your top 10 core values and a hard decision that you have to make right now, it, it just makes it a little more challenging. So um, it's critical. And it, it also, I need to also know an activity we do is when am I not living out my values? And for me, my body tells me. So I have, I feel kind of sick to my stomach. 
I might have this like tightness in my chest and a little bit of a uh, something going on right here. And that tells me like, I need to, to check in because that that is not how I wanted to show up in that conversation or gosh, I really got that wrong. Let me circle back um, to this person. And so I, I really listen to my body um, as a way to, to indicate like, let's, let's look at that again. Um, I'm not really living that out. So um, I really love values conversation. We could talk about that all day. All right. I know we are, um, we've got a lot of, a lot more questions. So one of the, we'll combine the last two, but you know, I want you to, to name out loud, because I think goals are really important. And when we say them out loud, um, it just brings them to life. And so pre COVID dreams, you know, I think we've, we've all abandoned to some degree what we were working on, because we had to, you know, I, I am fortunate on a campus, we were starting a strategic plan, and we continued to push through that. And that was an example of being able to, to continue to, to do something, um, in the face of of all of the 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 challenges that existed but what are your pre-covid dreams you know before covid here i had launched a, a mattering and belonging campaign and uh, it was going really well and i feel like you know that lost a little bit of momentum during this because we've been working on this not that not that i have um that I'm not focused on mattering and belonging every day or DEI work every day, but that campaign and the work around that has has been kind of on pause. So I'm starting to think about a relaunch and I'm thinking of it as a rebrand and not um, we left, we were picking up where we left, left off, but what are some new ways maybe we can think about that coming back into a, a post COVID environment. So what are others that you would wanna share with this group? I would love to know um, what are some of those things you were thinking about before the world changed? And if you're like me, I had to, I've had two weeks since my executive coach asked me that question. I needed to reflect, what were my pre-COVID dreams? I don't know. My brain is really fuzzy. You have to reach, go back into the far reaches exactly. where we're waiting for this one. This is a great right. Like, I don't even know what day of the week it is, much less what my dreams were. Wow. Um, presenting at a conference, Madison, and and that's, that's great. And I think there's lots of people who could help you with that. And um, funding got cut and I, I know that a lot that was a reality for a lot of campuses so hopefully that will be restored and lots of webinars and even things like this today that that hopefully you can start to think about that again vacations travel absolutely cruise traveling abroad lots of travel <laughs> conferences networking yes Maria's just started a job so the dream was to connect Maria and I true story Saw one another for the first time in real life a year after she started this job. So that's just what, and we knew each other ahead of time. It's just what our lives have been. Um, uh, Julia talked about an experience for her first year of grad school, was really thinking about that. So hopefully a second chance at that. Really excited to, welcome, uh, to launch a welcome weekend initiative, um, reclaiming Pro Devo, absolutely. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I encourage you to write these these down. I have started a list of things that I want to do personally and professionally. Um, and so, oh yes, honeymoon in Oahu, Oahu. I was able to travel to Hawaii right before the pandemic last year. And um, so that hopefully you can do that as, along with that PhD, Kiara, road tripping. So lots of things we wanted to do. And I think we probably forgot so I think it's an important question to just yeah. read. Um, and then I'm gonna, I think the lessons learned piece, I mean, we've talked about this some, but I want us to, to make sure we um, talk about this and give time to this overtly because we um, titled the session lessons learned. So I'm curious, what have you learned? And and I think that might help us as we're planning for re-entry, but um, you know, what are some of those things that you're already, um, considering and thinking about that maybe if we had not had this most disastrous year you wouldn't have you wouldn't have thought about you know what are some of those things that you appreciate 
learning. Um, I will say to kick us off for lessons learned, um, we've learned a new vocabulary. So, you know, pivot, unprecedented, reimagine, social distancing, PPE, I could go on and on, asynchronous, you're on mute. So uh, there, there are lots, lots of things that we have learned. Um, so professional, a deconstruction of, of professionalism and what that means. Yep. Giving grace, accepting grace. Lauren, good to see you. And accepting grace, right? So sometimes people are much easier to, to give it than to accept it or to give it to yourselves. Um, what's truly worth changing out of lounge, loungewear for, Abby? That's great. Um, some of you have gotten really good at, you know, business on top, party on the bottom. So um, you've learned that. <laughs> Connecting with family members. Yes. And the, important, the importance of that. Relearn the importance of health. Emily gained a better understanding of capacity and how to be okay if something's not perfect. Yes. More, more than what you do, who surrounds you. Yes, Chris. Um, Shane, how re recharging work from home can be and how to be a better, better at work-life balance. Yeah. And when you're, you know, those of you who are parents, I have a 12 year old and where we live, there was no curriculum after they were sent home. So it was, we're not teach from an equity standpoint, which I greatly appreciate. Not every student had access to a computer. Um, they did not teach any new curriculum. The both end of that is the challenge of being an educator and feeling like I needed to create something. So I'm trying to homeschool and, you know, and you just, did, I didn't feel like I was good at anything. Um, and so I think that grace part that Lauren mentioned is, is really important. I think some of the learn the lessons learned for me are, um, you know, adaptability of programs. So think there are some things that are really sh like, this is how we do things. MLK day of service is one of those great event. Always a Saturday before the Monday of MLK. We didn't have that option this year. Um, so we did MLK days of service for two weeks. How great is that? We're keeping it, you know? So we're not keeping it to the day of service. We actually got to serve more agencies and more students got to participate because we stretched it over two weeks. Um, adaptability and hiring. Some of you went through a search process during this. How many times has it been like, phone, campus, you know, day and a half interview. We've learned that we probably know what we need to know in four hours, you know, so, so really learning that piece. Um, flexible work modalities is another one that I mentioned. Shane kind of alluded to that. We had started tampering with um, like a day at home every two weeks before COVID. So that's something that people are so productive that we can continue to do. Julie said as a working parent, that you can manage things like weather delays and still be productive um, and present. Funny story, my sixth grader is really sad that there are no more snow days because everybody has a Chromebook. So um, I was like, oh, that's so convenient. And he's like, that is not fair <laughs> to my childhood. So um, so it's, it is interesting that we've been able to keep it going. Um, Yes, no, yes, no more snow days. I think many are equally sad. <laughs> Lots of people saying I equally miss snow days at the University of Tennessee. We don't get snow very often, but when we do, we don't close. So we've never really had that, um, that luxury here on our campus. Um, I think I've also learned um, the value of our work. You know, like I've known that it's important and I'll, I often say, our work, and I'm saying our work collectively, because if you're on this call, you're working closely with students, you're in leadership education to, to some extent. Our work is hard work and it's heart work. And the isolation that students have felt, the disconnection, it has relied on people like us to continue that. And so that's just been affirming to our to our work. Um, I'm realizing that we're ending, we need to end very soon. So. What I will say is this is something that I hope we can keep the conversation going that, um, that, that it may feel like, what have I done for the last year? But you've done a lot. Um, in many ways, you have been the person who's kept 
students or colleagues connected. Um, I talked to first years yesterday who said they don't want to go home um, because they've they have made a home here, even though it's been different than they anticipated. And I would just say some last like closing things and Abby, I'll turn it over to you. I know you have a couple of announcements is just closing thoughts um, is leadership. I heard this when I first came to this university three years ago, leadership is managing hope. And so, you know, we get to think about a life post COVID. We get to think about what we've learned. We get to think about what we're grateful for and we create those avenues for those that are around us. Um, and we have to continue to do that. I also think we have to, in the re-entry, re-establish our boundaries in, in a loving, respectful way, but also talk about that because it's had quite an impact on all of us. Um, we need to take vacation <laughs> now, in the summer, in the fall, in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, in the spring. It, vacation needs to be a part of, there, it is no bragging point to say I have three weeks of vacation accumulated. That's not what it's for. So I encourage you to use that um, and to make time for dinner time um, because that's important. And I, I end most meetings with it won't always be like this and we can do hard things. So the end is coming as, as we all, as many of us get vaccinated um, and we get to then think about what are the things we've learned. So I encourage you to write those down, to document them and not just write them down, but think about how you're gonna shift it to learning as we um, re-enter into this post COVID world. So with that, Abby, I'll turn it back over to you. I appreciate each of you and your contributions to our conversation. Shay, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. And I really appreciate being able to, I didn't expect I was going to laugh so much in this time and feel so joyful during this hour. And I'm so glad that I did. So thank you for the ways in which you um, provided a space for that. I truly, truly appreciate how genuine that felt um, and how much we learned, I think, in this time, a ways in which to practice those things and um, to reflect on a weird year and get ready for what happens next. So thank you for that. Thank you for that pivot. Absolutely. I, um, I would be remiss if I did not mention um, some of our leadership programs that we offer. Shay mentioned so many of them during this time and thinking about ways in which um, the University of Tennessee at Knoxville has partnered with leadership, but also in thinking about um, those lessons of our resilience program and thinking about how we show joy, how we share gratitude, um, how we bring about those ways that um, make us feel good and resilient again. So um, thank you for reminding us of these programs, Shay, and for those of you who might not know about Leadership, these are our program offerings. If you'd like to learn more, um, you can reach out to us on leadership.org or email us at lead at leadership.org. Um, and I would be remiss again if I did not share with you that with our vision, um, if you share our vision of a just, caring, and thriving world where all lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible, um, please feel that you can help us continue to do that by making a donation. You have a link to our donation page here. Uh, we will continue to provide these programs like this um, for free. We will do, we have more sessions the rest of this week. We will do another series of these in May. Um, and we will continue to make them free and available for people. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you for those who will come back and join us more for the rest of this week. Um, I see your comments in the chat and I appreciate time with you all as well. Um, so thank you for joining us. I think Shay, if you have time, we can stay on if um, anyone has questions or anything for us that they'd like um, sure. to hang out for a couple minutes, but otherwise thank you everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your Tuesday.